much. So, uh, Fitz, I think we should get together. Oh. or dead in the scene, but together forever. United against life as we know it. Let's get out of here. What was it? A big dog, maybe? Whoa. Whoa? That's it? Whoa? Think you see werewolves a lot? Did I change last night? How would the moon? How do you feel? Watch it. This is a very confusing time for your sister. Boys, body, trying to fit in. Hey, hey, take it easy. Who's the guy? If I wasn't here, would you eat her? Harvey! I'm growing up, and obviously you're not. Oh my god. You think I want to go back to being nobody? You're so dead. They're just being normal teenage girls. And welcome to the Cult Cinema Circle podcast. My name is Jesse, and I'll be your host. So now on today's episode, we're going to be covering a little movie from 2000. And this film, you know, it's kind of a seminal classic when it comes to the werewolf genre. Uh, We're going to be covering Ginger Snaps today. You know, I couldn't just do this all alone by myself. I needed to bring a guest on with me. So my guest today is a podcaster of his own, um, also is a comic book author, and all-around general, you know, geeky dude. Uh, Please welcome to my show, Dennis Robinson. Hey, Dennis, how are you doing today? Hey, Jesse, I'm doing just peachy as always. Thank you so much for having me on. Oh, you're welcome, of course. Yeah. So, I mean, I I became familiar with you after you actually reached out to me. We were just talking off mic about this. Mm -hmm. But you actually were referred to me by previous guests of the podcast, Travis Seedmaster, where you actually know them, and that's cool. Um, So I love that. But, um, (laughs) but yeah, I I know we we were talking a little bit. So to kind of get this out of the way now... um, I do know that, you know, currently, uh, as of this month, and um, you'll talk a little bit more about it, but you actually have a little bit of a Kickstarter going on for a project. So you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. So as you said in my intro, I write uh, comics about the world's first werewolf, which is, you know, why we're talking about a werewolf movie today. And so I have two books out in the series already, and the third one is on Kickstarter right now. And that one I describe as H.P. Lovecraft meets Gilgamesh. So it's 96 pages long and beautifully illustrated. And you can check it out if you go over to www.likenbook.com, L-Y-C-A-N-B-O-O-K. We have all kinds of rewards ranging from you know apparel glow-in-the-dark pins crochet werewolves you could even die in the next book like i will take 
Not you personally. I'll, you know, I'll take like your likeness and, you know, stick it in the book <laughs> and have you die horribly. <laughs> and then you get a print of your death page and I'll assign it for you and everything. So we got a lot of fun stuff in there. I love that. Yeah. What kind of was the inspiration for you even um, authoring the other uh, books that you did? So I love telling stories and it kind of got started with the, well, D&D, which is the other, the podcast that I do. And through that, you know, I, I, we joined a podcasting network. Then we went to Dragon Con for the first time ever and met some other nerds. And I had I always had this idea in my head for doing um, a comic book about the world's first werewolf and having him go through different time periods and running into different mythological beings and gods and stuff like that. So I pitched the idea to him and they they all loved it. And they were like, yeah, you need to do this. So that's when I basically figured out how do you write a graphic novel? I got a mentor who taught me the ropes and went through many, many uh, phases of editing and all that jazz. But what got me into werewolves in the first place was actually uh, elementary school when they would shove us in the library and be like, hey, let's go find a book and like occupy yourselves for like an hour, something like that. And I, I don't know how I found it, but I, I spotted this picture book about Lon Chaney's The Wolfman. It was like the whole movie, just, you know, picture book. And I'd never heard of a werewolf before. Opened it up and I was fascinated. Ever since then, I've always been attracted to characters that have like a duality, like The Incredible Hulk or Dr. Jekyll, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, stuff like that. So that's sort of how I got into werewolves. And then the other half of this coin, which is, you know, the mythology and the history and all that jazz. Back in the, I guess it was early 2000s or mid 2000s, God of War came out and I played that series and I like fell in love with Greek mythology. And through the podcast, we started doing other mythology. So I got to learn all about these crazy mythologies from around the world that like many people don't even know about because um, most people just talk about the Norse and the Greek um, or the Egyptian but there's all kinds of crazy crap out there. <laughs> so so I wanted to sort of mix these two worlds together and had an idea and then sort of shelved it and then brought it back up after the podcast. And that was six years ago when we started making the books. And the first one came out in 2022. And then the second one came out last year. And the third one's on Kickstarter now and should come out uh, before the end of the year. Good, good. Love that. I love that you also talked about your history a little bit with werewolves as well. Um, but yeah, please, you know, if you haven't already done so, uh, I actually got a copy of the book. Um, you nicely sent it to me. I haven't read through all of it, but I will say the illustrations are pretty boss. They look really cool. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I'm sure so. <laughs> kudos to whoever did those. But, you know, I always think like uh, it's good to some support, you know, projects and these kinds of things. And that's why I wanted to have you on today, of course. Well, thank um, you. I appreciate it. Of course. Yeah. But um, I guess, you know, when I talk about you talked about your history with werewolves, uh, it's funny because that's how I kind of got into like just horror in general. You mm -hmm. know, I found like, of course, like the Haunted Mask, the the book and the movie, uh, not movie, but like little TV like special. Uh, sure. That was like my heart right uh, from Goosebumps. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. But, I used to read the crap out of Goosebumps. Oh, hell yeah. yeah. The, when you said Haunted Mask, I was like, is he talking about Goosebumps? Because I had I definitely had the Haunted always i had like i got like the toy of it like um oh. it was, like change your voice and stuff oh yeah yeah all the time yes <laughs> but uh yeah of course but like there's that and then also like you know but being in the library and like yeah. reading a book and coming across scary stories to tell in the dark well yeah i like scary stuff and it just makes me think like if I had not found those books, because I have a deep, they are on my shelf right now, a, a deep fascination and love for the illustrations there and also sure. just the folklore in general. I've always yeah. kind of been uh, a little bit of a folklore nut myself, and I was into urban legends and mm -hmm. cryptids and all that kind of shit. So I'm always down for that kind of a thing. <laughs> so please, listeners, you know, um, if you would like to support Dennis's project uh, and the people he works with, um, when on this project, you know, you want to give a little bit open your purse a little bit and you know give a little bit at school um to help fund this project i love that but we're not here to just like talk you up okay that's one part <laughs> i but do have a question part, for you by the way sure sure did you used to watch are you afraid of the dark 
Always and forever. That was probably okay. the first okay. thing. Just, so, just wanted because you, you talked about goosebumps, and then you mentioned you know scary stories to tell. I'm like, yeah. did you also did you, did you hit the trifecta of the? Oh, you know, okay. I completely uh, right. separately from you. <laughs> I would always call that the trifecta. Okay. Um, I think like because how if I may ask, how old are you? Thirty eight. Uh, this month I'll be 38. Right. So I'm about 31 or so. So for me, like, uh, you're a little older than I am, but like, you're in a position where you would have also have seen these same things. I just was younger. Um, so yeah, I think for people like us who are a little bit older millennials somewhat, I think it's really interesting how we have those three, kind of pieces of media for horror Mm -hmm. that really just came out at the right time. And I don't think have really been replicated since. Um, So it's really interesting how we kind of had that. Um, Yes. Oh, are you afraid of the dark was definitely probably one of the first things uh, alongside goosebumps as well. And then once I actually got into school and realized what those books were scary stories to tell in the dark and stuff that's when yeah. i kind of went down that rabbit hole as well but okay. yeah absolutely but we're not just here to talk about that okay we're here <laughs> to talk about your experience so no, you're good because for me with werewolves i don't remember the first time i ever knew about a werewolf right um sure. probably like some cartoon or whatever you know like some looney tune type stuff or like yeah. whatever Shay, right? he got turned into a werewolf in that one sure. race right cartoon i think yeah something like that something. so you know i i don't know what my history was with it right okay but, but i've always been a lifelong horror person i've always just loved that stuff sure. um but to talk about you know ginger saps in particular you know i think like you know this film it, it is something where i probably recently watched it within the last 10 years or so or you mm-hmm. know when i first discovered it mm-hmm. um and watched it but like you know it definitely spoke to me in a certain way this is probably at least maybe three years ago i probably first saw it on shutter i don't think i saw it previous to that okay. um, when it was on there uh, at least for me with werewolves like i don't even know if i'd really watched a werewolf movie even before watching this to be okay. honest I don't think I had seen Werewolf, um, American Werewolf in London. I've never seen The Howling up to now. Mm-hmm. What are some other ones? Wait, I'm trying to think. Well, uh, so there's the Wolfman, then there's the Wolfman remake. Technically, Van Helsing has werewolves in it. Um, right. Silver Bullet, if you want to call that. A, I mean, technically, it's a werewolf. <laughs> it looks like yeah. a bear. <laughs> but right, exactly. Um, trying to. I mean, there are a ton of werewolf movies. The issue is. Uh, right. That werewolf movies tend to not get quite the same treatment as vampire movies because it's very hard to make a werewolf movie look good. Yes. Without it costing a lot of money. Whereas vampires just like, hey, you pop some fangs and you're done. Like you don't really have to do a yeah. whole lot extra. Um, werewolves, if you have the wrong lighting and the wrong suit or, you know, however you're doing it, man, it can go bad real fast and get into like janky territory. Um there are some newer werewolf movies, though the names escape me. There's one like on a train. There's one where it's set in like old England or something like that. And it's like a gypsy curse with like a silver set of fangs. I forget exactly what that one's called, too. It sort of comes in waves where you'll get a bunch of werewolf movies, it feels like, and then it'll just go nowhere for a bit and then it'll pop up a little bit and then back down and then just keeps going like that. Unlike zombies or vampires, where it's just almost always a constant like conveyor belt of people hitting you with different vampire and zombie movies. Yeah, totally. That makes a lot of sense. And even something like werewolf by night, like that Disney did. Yeah, that was great. Yeah. Yeah. And like even just any of that stuff. But I think this is like really one of the first werewolf movies I saw where I was like, oh, what, what's this doing? What's what's happening yeah. here? <laughs> um, and if I haven't already mentioned it, the reason I'm having you on today, uh, because you are a werewolf fan, but I, this is a shocking thing for me to know. You had never seen this movie up until a few days ago. Is that correct? Yeah, no, I hadn't seen it until two days ago is when I managed to sit down and watch it finally so yeah i just watched it <laughs> yeah no I, it, it had yeah. been recommended to me many times and everyone's always like well, how have you not seen ginger snaps so it's always been on my to-do i just never got around to it and anytime there's a podcast where it's just like hey let's talk about a movie you've never seen it's like hey this is a perfect opportunity to make me <laughs> actually check this off the bucket list so yeah yeah totally um and so yeah like so for me though i mean my history is just i saw it a couple of years ago and i've just 
fell for it in love with it i own it on blu-ray now and i just watched it last night um i was watching some of the effects special features behind as well so that was cool but like but yeah i mean i i just really like this story i enjoy i've seen all of the other ginger snaps the two and three i've seen those oh there uh, are other ones very, okay yes there's two uh, direct videos um, oh gotcha yeah is it the same TV. like is it the same like characters or yes. yeah oh okay one of okay. which is one of which is like right after this okay. and the other one is a prequel where it takes place in like 1800s uh but uh, it's okay still um the two main um it's still the two main uh actresses and they are kind of playing bridget and and uh Bri- bridget and uh ginger but like yeah it's a little different because it's back so, in the day so the one that is the direct sequel that has both the actresses in it too uh kind of sort of uh emily okay. perkins whose bridget is in it yeah uh Catherine isabel ginger as yeah. we will talk about sure. uh, um she's kind of in it but like okay. not really. <laughs> that's where like, i was confused a, i was like yeah okay <laughs> yeah i mean and then the prequel okay. is just them back in the day day so yeah but um but yeah so so i can't really ask you what your history was since it's so very recent um but I guess if anything, like before we kind of dive into any sort of talking about like the production or or any of this sure. kind of stuff, I kind of want to get your your because we'll also talk about like the plot themes, what you think sure. of the characters, all that kind of fun yeah. stuff. But I guess I want to just kind of glean from you. What did you think of this movie? Like, wh- I just want to hear what you had to say or did you like it? Did you not? And be honest, like, I want to know, like would you recommend it like or any of this stuff or or whatever so i guess give me the good give me the bad and sure you know, i just want to get what you thought of it before yeah. we begin into digging in about it and talking about it so this movie wasn't what i was expecting it to be and that's not to say in a good or bad way you know how when a lot of people recommend something to you like over and over and over and over again over years, you get sort of like an idea in your head of how it's supposed to be. And then when you actually get it, you're like, oh, that's actually completely different from what I was imagining. That's sort of how it happened here. And I actually had a similar experience, although not nearly as intense, uh, where people told me said the same thing about Scarface. And then I watched Scarface and was like, yeah, it's fine. Like it didn't blow my mind away like, you know. Everybody said it was going to blow my mind. It's like I've seen I've seen so many movies now. Like if I had seen it back then, yeah, it would have been amazing. <laughs> but I've already seen so many things that emulate that. But after that, so it's kind of similar with Ginger Snaps where there are like if I had seen this movie back in 2000, it probably would have blown me away. But now that I've seen and it still even now does a lot of things that I haven't seen before or like interesting little twists on this and that, which we'll probably get into as we talk more about it. But there were also some like weird little nitpicky things that were bugging me uh, while I was watching. And I was just like, oh, come, come on, I got like, all right, I can only dispe- like di- uh, suspend my disbelief for some. <laughs> <laughs> for so long about some things but but overall i would say i definitely enjoyed it it's definitely kind of weird trying to watch a movie about horny high schoolers when you're 38 because you're like this is why this movie would have been better to see when i was that age as opposed to now <laughs> but i would say overall i did enjoy the movie and i did like the plot and there there are definitely things that i would probably change about it or things that I didn't like but I would say overall yeah no I enjoyed it it's de- I'm, I'm definitely not regretful that I watched it or anything like that yeah we could also probably get into the nitpicks a little bit later I don't mind that <laughs> That's fine. um but yeah I I but I'm glad you enjoyed yourself at least yeah, yeah it is kind of weird because I never want to like uh, it's always one of those things where I'm like you know I was just thinking about that today or I just think about that is like sure I don't want to overhype something and be like, oh my God, it's the best thing ever. Right. Yeah. Um, but I still think it is like, I am somebody who like, you know, um, but I always want to caveat, I want to make that caveat of like, it may not be for you, but just give it a try. Yeah. So, no, hundred you know, percent. For me, I think one of the best TV shows is six feet under. Right. 
but like some people may be like, yo, I hated that show. Like, and that's <laughs> fine. Or people are I, like, you know, I've never heard anyone say they hated that show, though. Everybody I've ever right. talked to about that show is just like, oh, yeah, no, that was such an underrated or like such a great show that people so just good. forgot about because it kind of came. It, it had its heyday and then sort of like five went years. And then, yeah. And yeah. Then left. But there's that, you know, really good on HBO or, or like when people were like, why is Shit's Creek winning all of the awards this one year <laughs> during COVID? Right. Yeah. What the hell? And when I actually go to watch it, I'm like, oh, no, this show is actually good. Like, it's yeah. actually decent. Like, yeah, and it's really interesting. And it's not just like, you know, Dan and Eugene Levy, like pulling each other's dicks, although they'd be yeah. kind of weird because they're, you know, father and son. <laughs> yeah, be kind but of but I'm saying like, sure. it could be a thing of like, oh, really? Like, oh, and yeah. they had their daughter in there, too. Like the daughter of him is there. So like, yeah, it's just one of these and things Kath- where you're like, oh, Kath- how could Hera's in that mo- in that show? Right. Is yes, that the mom? Yes. Catherine? Yeah. Um, I mean, that's a that's a pretty stellar cast, but right. the writing on that show is also really good. And I'm I'm sad to say yes. I haven't seen too, too much of that show. I've seen a few episodes yeah. here and there, and I get a lot of crap for it at work, but uh that in yeah, the office. No, those two I haven't seen very much of. See, I don't crap. watch the office like that. I'm not but like for I'm me, not, like those are shows that I'm like, oh, these are so good. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, no, so like sitcom y sort of stuff is usually not my forte. Like I like a show with like a story. The only the only caveat to that is always sunny in Philadelphia. Like I just like watching those trash people do ridiculous things. Like it makes me happy and I could, I could have it on the background. I don't even have to watch it and I'll still laugh every time at the weird jokes years and years later. So, um, so it just depends, but yeah, the office Shit's Creek, that sort of stuff usually doesn't fall in my normal watching sort of stuff. I don't know. Yeah, totally. That makes that makes Someday. sense. Or like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or like even with sitcom-y things, like, you know, so for me, the only kind of sitcom I want to watch Living Single because uh, it's on uh, it's uh Queen Latifah. It's like uh, you know, it was from the nineties. This is one oh, of the okay. black sitcoms. Gotcha. Uh, the thing is that people say that people want to claim that friends mm. kind of aped off of Living Single and uh, you know became way more successful. Yeah. I wouldn't be shocked, uh, but, <laughs> you know, um, uh, because literally our country is founded on, you know, taking from people and, you know, we blah, 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 can get in all that. But we're also two white people, <laughs> yep. but like you guys, um, so it's fair to <laughs> know, like, yeah, come on. But yeah. and I also don't understand friends. I don't get the appeal. <laughs> I, it's it, that. And uh, I was I'm the same way with that. I'm also the same way with Seinfeld. Like I've tried watching. I'm like, I just don't. Apparently Kirby Seinfeld's fun because it's like horrible people, but like I'm just like yeah, you know, I've watched it and I'm like they're they're not my kind of horrible people. Like always sunny, like those people are horrible people, and that's my kind of horrible people. Maybe it's because it's supposed to be set in PA, and that's where I live, so maybe that's why I get it. I don't know, but um, yeah, Seinfeld. I just I don't know, it just does, which is yeah. weird because Curb you and your enthusiasm, which is the same writer, it's Larry David and all that jazz. Like I've seen his show, like bits of it. That show's way funnier to me than Seinfeld is, and that show's also a bunch of terrible people. But I don't know. I think it's just a, a flavor sort of thing. Totally, totally. Yeah. I mean, it's just one of those things. They're like, but with sitcoms, like, I mean, I want to watch Living Single because um, it's like five mm-hmm. seasons, cool. Okay. And then I will always have a heart. Like, I don't like Full House that much, but, like, sure. I will always go up for Boy Meets World. I will always go up for that show a lot of the time because I'm like, no, this show is actually pretty decent and interesting. Sure. Um, and also Sabrina because I can't let it go. Yep. Never so let it go. I used to watch those two, which is why Topanga was my first uh, crush. And then Family Matters. I mean, it was all TGIF. Pretty, I'm pretty sure all those shows were on TGIF. They so were, like, they were. Yeah. So, that, that, I mean, that's literally every Friday. Watch should be, yep. Sabrina, Family Matters, Boy Meets World, all that stuff. Yep. Grew up on the same stuff. <laughs> Amazing. Like, it's just, and those are things where I'm just like, oh no, this is actually a decent thing. But, yeah. but to be, go back to the point, I don't want to ever feel like, you know, oh God, it's like so good. But like, to me, I'm just like, no, it is good to me. Yeah. You just might not like it. So, yeah. but I'm glad you at least enjoyed yourself. I'm, I'm oh, glad yeah, yeah. with that. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> But yeah, so we're going to move into a little bit about, you know, talking about the film and all this. And then we can okay. also get into like, you know, we'll, we'll get into the plot and all that. But I do want to sure. hear, We remind me to, you know, obviously we're on a podcast right now, we're recording. But like, <laughs> I want to make sure we talk about your nitpicky things that maybe you didn't like. Well, but... they might pop up in our conversation and sure. other stuff. 
probably <laughs> fair fair <laughs> but this movie in particular ginger snaps it uh was released i believe it made its uh zurich uh like international film festival release uh in august 1st of 2000 and then it was i think released in 2001 at some point um because this was kind of a from what i understand a home video thing this really did not go to theaters like that in the states maybe in canada a little bit but like it's not like this was a theatrical wide release or anything like that. yeah i saw that it had a box office but I hadn't heard of it. So I was like, I don't know if this was in theaters yeah. in the US. Um, yeah. But I mean, the, the I, movie was yeah. shot in Canada. So it probably did come out in Canada, maybe some other right. countries and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. And I think even the numbers, because I really didn't find a whole lot of numbers for it. But I think, if yeah. anything, I think even the box office was like maybe a little under. 415 like 415 maybe like yeah i don't think it made its budget no 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 no, not at all um we're looking at 108 minute 108 minute runtime and then this was distributed by motion international and it had about four and a half million uh estimated which again if you know anything about making movies which not like i make (laughs) movies but i i know a thing or two uh that is low budget so yes (laughs) Pretty low budget, uh, yeah. which is crazy to think, but it is. Uh, but yeah, so there's that. Uh, I have no real uh, box office information to give or anything like that. But what I can say is that uh, critically, at least, this uh, is sitting at 80% on Rotten Tomatoes with about uh, 59 reviews from critics. Okay. So that's people who literally are either, I guess, are actually writers on publications and mm-hmm. or they're independent writers who just have enough of a following to be a rotten critics person. So a rotten yeah. tomatoes person, rotten critics, right? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, our show, then, we call it the thermometer. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then 78% from just like the public out okay. of about uh, 50,000 ratings. So people okay. going on there being like, this sucked or this is great. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's about 78% average. That's pretty good. Yeah. And then about three and point six out of five on letterbox, which I think is the voice of the people okay. because a lot of people have letterbox film bro or not. So there's gotcha. that. Yeah, um, so that, that kind of falls yeah. right in line with the 78%. Then I would say like, it's pretty clear. I mean, three point something stars is pretty close to 78. So I would say right. it seems pretty universal, I guess, I think so in terms too. of the audience liking it. I think so too. Yeah. Um, now this movie in particular was, uh, directed by John Fawcett. So Mm -hmm. he had gone on to, I don't know if you know anything particular about him. Um, he directed a movie called taken the dark and last exit, but you may also know him at all. If you know about the BBC show orphan black, because he also co-created that if you weren't already aware. Um, so taken's not the Liam Neeson or, Lee, is it Liam Neeson? No, it's not Liam Neeson. Liam. I don't uh, think it's. I don't think it's that taken. I okay, think it's, it's a different taken. taken. Okay, gotcha. I was gonna say. I, I was like, really? Right. Wow. <laughs> no, he did a movie called Taken. I believe. I think it's just a smaller movie. Okay, uh, but yeah. <laughs> but he did, uh, along with uh, Graham Manson, he co-created and is a director on the BBC series Orphan Black, which is that's how awesome. kind of a lot of people know him. So yeah, I was but gonna say it's a pretty movie. popular show. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. And he also did uh, like Xena Warrior Princess. He did um, some episodes of Queer as Folk, uh, Lost okay. Girl, stuff like that. He also okay. directed some of those episodes. So I definitely grew up on Xena and Hercules as well. So probably <laughs> saw his episodes. <laughs> yeah, probably most likely. I wouldn't be surprised because also it doesn't surprise me because I loved Queer as Folk, uh, the old mm-hmm. one. And yeah. that was all shot in Canada. So it makes sense. Yep. Yep. Uh, Karen Walton. Uh, so she has actually, uh, she wrote Ginger Snaps, but she's also uh, actually wrote on Queer as Folk for about three episodes, which is cool. Oh. Um, and she also actually was a writer and producer on like Flashpoint, um, The Listener and Orphan Black, which is fun because... <laughs> That's, yeah. you know, John Fawcett's show. So that's kind of fun. Um, but yeah, and also not a fan of horror. So that's kind of fun. Like, she didn't really care for horror like that. But, yeah. you know, we'll get into to how this came about. But like, you know, it's not like she went in being like, I love horror so much. He was more the horror fan. He yeah. was the one who was watching, you know, all these horror movies and loving this stuff. Right. 
and wanted to do that. And okay. she was just like, bro, I don't know about that. But like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. it's interesting because so I don't usually say this too often, but I'm also not the biggest in general horror fan because uh, I have like. I have certain criteria for like movies that I like. I like movies with good characters and good plot. If it's a horror movie and that fits that bill, cool beans. If it's not, it's not. There's a lot of horror movies that are like we watched. We we do like a bad movie night kind of thing. And we watched Paranormal Activity and I watched it and I said, how are there like 10 of these movies? Nothing happens. The whole movie. <laughs> there are no characters. There's no plot. It's just sitting here watching a room for like 10 minutes at a time. So like. But the thing, that's definitely a horror movie. And I love the thing because, again, really good characters, really good plot, keeps you engaged, that sort of thing. So um, but horror in general is not usually my like my go to. Um, Yeah. So it's kind of funny that I write werewolf books then. (laughs) Yeah, I know. Right. It's just like you might go to a convention to be like, hey, what about my book? Well, it's <laughs> like, another funny thing is my favorite conventions to go to are horror conventions because they're the most fun. Like, they are the, the most fun. The booths are the most creative and like just crazy. Mm. You go to a Comic Con, like everybody's got the same thing. Like it's you know it's the wall of prints and you know, some people have comics like me or whatever. It's eh, it's kind of all the same. But horror shows, oh, yeah. you never know. I did a horror show last week where there was a fifty or not last week last year. They had a 15 foot python next to me, Hell yeah. <laughs> like at the booth. And I'm like, okay, there was a guy selling, uh, it was one of the guys who played Jason. He was selling mm-hmm. actual machetes that he would sign. I was like, well, there's not something you see every day. Yeah, yeah exactly. So horror shows, those are the most fun. Yeah. Um, I know of Monster Mania, at least, at least in our yes. neck of the woods. I will but be there in, in Baltimore uh, this year, actually, because hey. they moved it. So yeah. they did. They moved it from Hunt Valley down to Baltimore yep. City. So please be safe. But um, you know, you won't be. <laughs> it won't be too bad. But you gotta be careful in downtown Baltimore. I'm just sure. Saying. But I've like, been to Baltimore you know. Comic Con twice, and that's right. right there at the Inner Harbor. If uh, memory serves me, anyways, it, it is. It, yeah. They're moving it to there. So you're you're. It's not too far off. Matthew yeah. Lillard's gonna be there, y'all. Oh my god! I met him last year. Talked to him twice. He's coming back to Baltimore because he was, was in a John Waters movie. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was Monster Mania in Philly, and he was doing a Kickstarter for his board game because he has like a board game company. Yeah, he was just he does D and D stuff, doesn't he? Uh no. I mean that particular board game, I forget exactly, but I think it was like their own. It was like a sci-fi. Yeah, I can't remember exactly what it was that he made, but I remember looking it up, and I was going to be like, "Oh, if I see him, I'll tell him good luck." And then I looked it up, and it was like. He'd already made like two hundred thousand dollars on it, like one day in. So like he's like, okay, he doesn't need. But he wandered up my aisle, and I said, "Hey man, I just want to say, you know, good job with the Kickstarter." He's like, "Oh, what's it even at?" <laughs> I was like, like, "I don't know." That must, that must be so nice to not have to worry about that. But then the next day, I saw him, and he came up the alley again. And before I could even say, this, he's like, "Hey, it's at this percentage." And we high fived. We're <laughs> super nice guy. Oh, so, yeah. I love that. I love to hear but that. Oh my god. The other thing uh, that I heard from a lot of people because that that show was all about the autographs was that Matthew Lillard would get out from behind his table. And if you were disabled in any way, or if you had like a stroller with kids, he would literally go out around the table, go down the line and grab you and pull you to the front. So that way you could get your picture. So you didn't have to stand in line like all day. He was apparently everybody I talked to, he was like the sweetest guy and like super, super nice. So I love that. For, I love that because he is my shaggy always and forever. <laughs> <laughs> like he, he can't not be yeah. um and also just like him and serial mom and him and slc punk and i love that man so much like i <laughs> oh I, I i know he probably he's probably very good about dealing with fans and i'm not like a huge fan boy like that sure but i'm just like no but you're matthew lillard though like yeah. I, you obviously know <laughs> that but like are you aware that you are so cool like you are aware of that you have to be like but <laughs> So I, I celebrities yeah. are weird in the sense that like a lot of most of the celebrities that I've met yeah. are like just normal people and they really just want to be treated like a normal person and yeah. hate when people go super, super crazy. Yeah. That's uh, fair. And then every once in a while you run into the ones that <laughs> like we were talking about before the show with the with their own blurb kind of a thing where they have very uh, yeah. certain expectations about how you're supposed to interact with them and things like that. And they get kind of high and mighty on you my i prefer the ones that just are like normal people that you just have like a normal conversation with it's just like okay well that was good 
Yeah, exactly. Uh, but yeah, so Karen Walton, back to Karen Walton. I promise oh, yeah, this yeah. is a that spot. We get sidetracked very good. easily. It's fine. That's what my show is. But like, it's fine. Yeah, but um, the composer of this movie is Mike Shields. Um, the only thing I really found from him, um, because the score is kind of interesting in this movie. It's mm-hmm. they start with the same music and they end with the same music, so that's mm-hmm. kind of fun. But yeah. uh, he also did Tucker and Dale versus Evil, which I um, would recommend um as a fun little thing because I just think it's a fun little movie. I've um, heard good things. It is. It's actually really decent and fun. It's like really slapstick and stupid, but like, sure. <laughs> oh yeah. If you're into that kind of a thing, yeah. like if you like bad movies, cause listen, let me tell you something, Dennis, I <laughs> love a bad movie here and there, but the yeah. bad movies got to, got to work for me. Okay. Sure. And, uh, I don't think Tucker and Dale is a bad movie, but like it's in the, I don't know. It's, it doesn't take itself super seriously. It's like campy. Yes, absolutely. Campy, yeah. I was going to say, oh. that's a fine line of the whole it's so bad, it's good versus nah, it's just bad or it's boring. You, but can't be. What do you think my whole it's... show's about? You know, <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> like it is that. And I love those kinds of movies, depending yeah. on what they are, I guess. But completely. Yeah. yeah. Well, if you want then, a, a movie that's so bad, it's good. Ooh. Let me tell you, Suburban Sasquatch. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> it's so bad. And it's filmed in PA, but it's like they oh, have yeah. one sound effect for the Sasquatch. And they're not like a normal monster movie where, you know, you barely ever see it. Oh, no, no, no. You see it a lot and it's real okay. bad. And it's love just it. it's fantastic. <laughs> I love that. Yes. Um, anyway, so then Tom Best is our cinematographer of this movie. Okay. He did uh, Prayers for Bobby, which is the Sigourney Weaver sad movie about uh, her son unaliving himself after oh. being, coming out as gay i think and it was a okay. lifetime i think uh oh. and then also little italy as well he also okay. shot that movie <laughs> all right um yeah brett sullivan who is like uh he was actually on the special features of this uh, blu-ray which is fun talking about this um he has had an interesting little uh little editing journey he actually edited uh saw four i believe um Okay. Saw IV, so Saw 4. I know Ro- no, Roman numerals. I know them. Um, and he also did a Christmas I prefer to call story. it Saw IV. That's fine. Yeah, Saw <laughs> IV. It's fine. Um, and he also did a Christmas horror story, which is on Shudder. That's a little okay. anthology movie, a uh, Christmas horror anthology. It's a okay. little movie. It's not bad. Funny enough, uh, because I think it was also produced by the same people who did this. Uh, a Christmas horror story also takes place in Bailey Downs, which is where huh. this movie takes place. All right. But it's All not right. like, but it's not like interacting with the Fitzgeralds or anything. It's literally yeah. like, it's just set in Bailey Downs. Okay. <laughs> just funny. <laughs> But yeah, so that's a little bit about the crew uh, in okay. terms of, you know, anyone in particular. I mean, if I want to go in my letterbox real quick, uh, just to see if there's anybody else that, worth of note um, to talk about. Give me a moment while I look that up. Um, so yeah, I definitely didn't I recognize the crew, but I, I did recognize, mm-hmm. <laughs> funny enough, the, the two main actresses. Yeah. Both were on one of my favorite TV shows. But uh, we'll never interacted that. with each other. So, yeah, <laughs> uh, that's so funny. Um, he so uh, Brett Stephen Hoban. Sorry, Stephen Hoban. He produced this movie. He also produced uh, all the sequels and he also produced uh, Christmas Horror Story, like I was talking about. And then also Black Xmas from 2006. OK. And in the tall grass, which is on Netflix, it's a Stephen King adaptation. So he also oh. produced that. Yep. All right. Trying to see what else. Uh, Noah Siegel is also, he is um, co-president of Elevation Pictures. So he's an executive producer. He's done a okay. lot of um, Canadian productions, most likely, it seems like. Got it. I'm trying to see if anybody else of of note. Not really anybody that I can see that's like super notable that I'm like, oh, mm. yeah, we could talk about it. But we're going to yeah. talk about these actresses. So <laughs> we got good old Miss Emily Perkins and mm-hmm. Catherine Isabel, Katie as she's uh, known to her friends, apparently, uh, okay. who play uh, Bridget and Ginger, respectively. Um, what's the TV show that you know Supernatural. them from? Supernatural. Oh, really? Yeah. So uh, Catherine, or Katie, was yeah. in the second season of the show where she had 
superpowers and she was sort of like feigning to be a damsel in distress, but was straight up murking people. I oh, uh, like yeah. to like make her way to the top before she got off. And then uh, what was the name of the other actress again? Emily Perkins. Emily Perkins actually had a recurring role for a number of seasons as she was an obsessed fan uh, because in that, are you familiar with Supernatural? Okay. So in that show, it gets very meta after a while because there's a quote unquote prophet who just writes like cheesy books about their lives. So they have a fan base for them in their own universe, but but they're like living their lives and whatnot. So I can't remember her name. I feel like it's Becky or something like that, but she's a hardcore fangirl and like has like pictures and writes fan fiction of the two brothers together and all this stuff. And so she pops up many, many times throughout the show before uh, her ex-boyfriend who also happens to be God offs her and turns her into to dust. So very kind of weird thing, but yeah. So she was on that show for quite a while too, but yeah, those two characters never, Never interacted or anything, but I just thought it was weird that I was watching. It's like, oh, those two are from Supernatural. Okay. All right. Yeah, it's funny, too, because I think they were both also, I think, on the X-Files at some point. Okay. Uh, respectively, um, where they were on there. And also, fun little thing, too, is that they also, um, some people say that they were born in the same hospital and, like, all that shit. Wow. Um, and they, like, grew up together. Okay. That's not completely true. It's not like they were best friends. Sure. They were. They did go to the same school. They were okay. represented by the same talent agency. Oh, okay. All this kind of stuff. So they were aware of each other because actually Emily Perkins is older than Catherine Isabel. Catherine okay. Isabel is only like 41 or something. And, Ka- and oh, um, okay. Emily Perkins is like 45 at this point, I think. So like oh, okay. literally... She's a little older than her, but like it's yeah. not by anything crazy, but they would have su- probably been aware of each other and yeah. all of that. So, yeah. But you never know. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And um, Ka- uh, Catherine, I actually saw her in a horror movie in December because my friend she's like a trash panda for horror movies like the the worse they are. She's like, yes, give give me give me. So we yeah. watched. It's a wonderful knife. Did you watch this? <laughs> I have not watched it. It's on my list too. Oh, it's um, so bad. Uh, but she's in it. it, it she's like she the, is. She's the lesbian, lesbian aunt. aunt. Yep. 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 So it's just like, oh, okay. Uh, do you watch Yellow Jackets at all? Like at all? I haven't, but I've uh, I haven't seen it, but I've run into a lot of fans at conventions. It, it's very good. It's on in Showtime. So if you have Paramount okay. Plus, you can watch it. I okay. would recommend it. Um. So there's a character named Laura Lee, who is a very religious girl in the movie, okay. in the show, um, mm-hmm. who's one of the people who, um, you know, is stranded in the middle of the woods. OK, we all know what it's about. Sure, it's right. not like that crazy. Uh, yeah. Laura Lee from Yellow Jackets is the girl from It's a Wonderful Life. That's how she's like famous. Oh. So it's kind of funny how like, yeah. And if you watch Yellow Jackets, you'll learn more about Laura Lee. But OK, it's just funny that like that's her big break. Um, OK. Also, Joel McHale's there for some reason. That's cool. Yeah, it's Justin Long's there for some reason. Yeah, I don't he's know. The, yeah, <laughs> it's it's a whole thing. That movie's a um, whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> also, uh, I want to watch it. It's on Shutter. It's called yeah. Influencer. It's a movie, and the lady uh, Cassandra something or other—I don't remember her last name—but okay. she's the one who has the wine stain on her um, face. Okay, who plays um, Catherine Isabel's uh, Gail Prescott? I think her name was <laughs> Jesus yeah. Christ. Um, uh, that's her her partner in the movie. So yeah. that's kind of fun. Um, but yeah, I've. I've heard, I've heard middle. I've heard both. I've heard, okay. you know, this is a really fun gay movie, and then also this is dog shit. So like, <laughs> whatever. But like, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. So she was in that. You're right. There's just yeah, that movie. I could I could go on long, long <laughs> talk about that one. But that's what we're not here for. But even you know, even my bad. friend who's a trash panda for her movies like. Man, this movie fucking sucks. Oh, I love that. <laughs> you, me, and your friend would probably we could get along. Probably, oh, she gets along I with everyone. Also, yeah. 
but I'm also a trash panda. I love that trash panda for trash. Yeah. Trash. Give me the lurid trash. I am well, kind of here for it. She'll recommend movies. So like we have like a, a little group and she'll recommend movies. And she's like, oh, this one, you guys, this one's really good. And then we'll all watch it. We're like, what the hell are you talking about? She, and nobody liked it except for her. She's you like, I don't understand. It was so good. It's like, no. <laughs> maybe she maybe she can just appreciate the beauty. That That's probably is- true. The, maybe she could just appreciate the beauty that is Frankenhooker more than y'all can. You know what? Hey, That's fine. There ain't nothing wrong with Frankenhooker. Oh, I love Frank that. You... Frankenhooker's good, yeah. Oh, I, I love that movie. Um, oh, God. That comes from a different, like, those types of horror movies just come from, a, it's a different age, man. Like, oh, the yeah. way they did, like, stuff back then, it's just, you're not going to see anything like that these days. Like, it's nope. just... I don't know. It's just a Frank different Headlutter animal. Is a weird man, but I love yeah, him. Yeah, it's just uh, a different. <laughs> it's a different animal these days. Oh, I love it. Anyway, so yes, <laughs> but these two actresses. So Emily Perkins. Did you ever watch the It miniseries back from the nineties? Yeah, she's yeah. Bev. With Tim Curry. She's young. Yeah, she's young Bev. So she's uh, the one where her dad's like, Bevy, I worry about you. Yeah. Um, and she sees the fucking blood in her like bathroom. Yeah, that's Emily yeah. Perkins. Fun fact. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> she's also in juno have you ever seen juno no it's another one of those movies that's on my it's a good one elliot page to do. pre-transition yep. um great uh she plays the uh emily perkins plays the abortion clinic receptionist uh, uh okay. in the beginning of the movie so be on the lookout for her okay uh, she's fun <laughs> and she's also in she's the man i don't remember that movie it's an amanda Bynes movie uh, i didn't watch it i recall it but i don't it's remember where, if it's I ever where saw she's it. Pretending to be a boy, yeah, and it's, it's like a it's pretty soccer healthy. or something. Is that what it was? Yes. Or something yeah. I forget. Yeah, mm-hmm. and then it's basically Catherine the Isabel. reverse premise of Ladybugs. It kind Maybe. of is, but also it's Twelfth Night from Shakespeare. Oh, gotcha. Okay, yeah. Um, and then and, and Catherine Isabel, who I love, mm-hmm. uh, she is from Freddy vs. Jason. Yeah, so she's in that movie, um, playing Gib, mm-hmm. uh, who had a very mean boyfriend who I did not like. No. Um. And also, she is in Disturbing Behavior. I think that's a fun little movie from the 90s okay. to watch. Yeah. She plays James Marsden's sister in that. Um, she is in Supernatural, like you talked about. But she's mm-hmm. also in American Mary uh, as well. I don't know. Um, which is a R-word revenge movie, pretty much, from uh, the 2012, 2010s, okay. um, directed by the Soska sisters. So, oh. Uh, you know, it's interesting. It's about her yeah. being a medical student who um takes her medical uh knowledge and training mm-hmm. into something uh a little bit, you know, doing some back alley surgeries and shit. Mm-hmm. That's all you gotta know. <laughs> all right. <laughs> yeah, but um <laughs> then you have Chris Lemke, uh, who is in Existence from David Cronenberg. He plays okay. Uh, Sam, I believe his name is, uh, and he's also in Final Destination Three. Um, he is in okay. That movie. Um, also, who in Final Destination Three is Jesse Moss. I already like him because his name is Jesse, so that's nice. Sure. Hey, there you go. Uh, and he's also in Tucker and Dale as well. He's also he plays like the asshole Chad guy. I don't think Fuck his name's yeah. Chad, but he's like a Chad. Yeah, and yeah that's, that's literally what we call him around here too. All the college the frat guys, we just call yeah, him Chads. Chad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Chad, bro. Gotta watch. You gotta watch Tucker and Dale versus Evil. Just give okay. it a shot. Okay. Because uh, we'll be like, isn't that that guy? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, it'll be great. Um, and then Mimi Rogers. Were you familiar with Mimi Rogers before? Is that the mom? Yes, Pamela. So the mom and the dad I've seen in other stuff before. And I can't now if you were to say what were they in, I could not tell you for the life of me what they were in, but I know I've seen those two in other stuff before. Yeah. So Mimi Rogers. Yes. Well, the reason you'd know who Mimi Rogers is is because she was in Austin Powers at one point. Um, but also she was ex-wife to uh Tom Cruise. So she escaped Cyber. Oh. <laughs> At some point, I didn't even know that. Yep, Nicole yep, Kidman was the was the earliest wife of his that I remember. So, Jesus, mm-hmm. I I come from the Katie Holmes of it all. Uh, so. Okay, okay, yeah. Which you know, that's all fun and dandy. Yep. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to remember who the uh, who's the guy? Who's the dad? Is the dad John Bourgeois or whatever? <sighs> who the fuck is the dad in this movie? He's barely in it. He is barely in it. You're he's, very right. He's basically. I mean, to me, he's just like, gen- I mean, pretty generic <laughs> or he really uh, is. average dad. Like 
if there was a dad, yeah, this is probably what that dad would be like. Yeah. What did you know him from? Did you, had you seen him? You can't remember. I just, I recognize his, I'm very good with faces. So like, I know I had seen him before, but I don't remember what I had seen him in. He was in X-Men Apocalypse, maybe. Hmm. Uh, Okay. Yeah. And a couple different movies. He's, he's made the rounds. He seems like a nice Canadian actor, man, is what it looks like. (laughs) Yeah. I, I, we'll go off of that. All right. Oh, fun little thing too. If you didn't already know this, um, if you watch the movie again and the announcements on the um, the school uh, announcements that come over, actually, mm-hmm. apparently, Lucy Lawless is one of the announcers on there, which is kind of fun. Oh, okay. Yeah, cute. Love that. Huh. Th- that's like the big things. I think her and John Fawcett, I think, were like, uh, they were like uncredited for that kind of stuff or something like that, from what I remember. Um, okay. And, yeah. So... A little bit about our cast. Those are like kind of the heavy hitters, if you will. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit about how this movie came to be. Okay. So, okay. you know, we got to put this into a little bit of context. So, like I said, John Fawcett uh, was a horror fan growing up, wanted to make horror movies, was into that kind of shit. Right. Mm-hmm. So he is quoted as saying that um, I knew I wanted to make a metamorphosis movie and a horror movie. I also knew that I wanted to work with girls. Um, And in January of 1995, where he had met this new friend of his, Karen Walton, Mm -hmm. um, who was initially reluctant to write this script due to the horror genre's reputation for weak characters, poor storytelling, and a negative portrayal of women. Mm -hmm. Um, So she had her her reservations. However, Fawcett convinced her that um, this film would reinterpret the genre. Um, And Walton has said, quote, a lot of werewolf movies seemed very much the same. My favorite, of course, was an American werewolf in London because it was at least a little punk about it. But Mm -hmm. it was still two white dudes grappling with the beast inside of them, which really it's only one of them and the other one's dead. But. Yeah, I love stories that work on a whole lot of different levels for a whole bunch of different kinds of people Um, that it turned out to be okay in the marketplace is just one girl's voice and a director who really wanted to support this is remarkable, I think, for the day. So, you know, he knew that uh, John Fawcett knew, like, okay, I want this woman to write it. Like, it'd be really good to have that. Mm -hmm. But they encountered some financing issues, as you do. Um, They approached a producer, Steve Hoban, who they had previously worked with, and he agreed to actually finance the film and to produce it or Mm -hmm. to try to get that. He then got a guy named Ken Chubb to edit and polish the story from Walton's screenplay. And then after uh, two years, they were ready to actually look for financiers. Okay. Um, So... Motion International, which was the distributor of the movie wholeheartedly, committed to co-financing and doing Canadian distribution of the movie. And Trimark Pictures, which is U.S., agreed to be the co-financier, the U.S. distributor, and also do the international sales as well. Okay. So the film seemed ready to go in about fall of 1998. And I want you to keep that in mind. <laughs> okay. Because, however, though, negotiations with Trimark at the time caused the producers to miss the budgeting deadline for Telefilm Canada, which is the Canadian Federal Film Funding Agency. And mm-hmm. rather than go ahead with only 60% of their funding, Hoban decided to wait a year um, for Telefilm's funding. And during this interval, Trimark dropped the movie. Lionsgate Films, who you will know from the Saw yeah. franchise um, and other <laughs> movies, uh, who Trimark would end up merging with um, in 2000, took Trimark's place and Mm -hmm. Unipix uh, Entertainment uh, agreed to distribute the film on uh, DVD along with Artisan Entertainment, who at this point was kind of riding the high of their success with the Blair Witch Project. Okay. And so the American DVD release came from them. And like we were saying, it's about a $4.5 million budget. Okay. So um, do you have anything to add or anything fun or can I, you want to? No, not, yeah, you you keep going. Yeah. You're on a roll. Right. No reason to stop you. <laughs> all right. So, all right. So, remember, I told you the movie seemed good to, uh, you know, in 1998, it was it was yeah. good to go, right? And we thought, yeah. okay, let's try it. Well, guess what happened? Right, uh, soon before uh, they were about to go into production. What? A little event called Columbine. Ah. Uh, so. Oh. 
in April of 1999, there was this uh, horrible tragedy in um, Colorado, I believe. uh, And really, really did a number on, um, you know, media as a whole, because instead of trying to have actual gun laws that are, you know, gun control laws or anything like that, um, you know, we just want to blame people for it. Blame violent movies, horror Mm -hmm. movies. Video whatever games. the hell all this stuff yeah. instead of actually not just having decent gun control laws but whatever yeah. or um, mental health stuff or yeah. mental health or any of this stuff and yeah. then also similarly there was something in canada that also there was a, a bit of a mass shooting thing that happened soon uh-huh. after that unfortunately um okay. so needless to say that put a little bit of a damper um and literally so the movie I think went into production like maybe August of that year, 1999. Okay. But you got to remember if you know anything about filmmaking or if you have be aware of anything, you got to do a lot of the other stuff before you go into production, like casting and stuff. Right. Yeah. So a lot of casting agencies, uh, you know, in Canada and all this, they were outraged at, you know, um, this movie that, you know, was trying to cast about, you know, oh, there's this violence going on in high school and blah, 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 blah. And there was a boycott of this movie where it was a little hard to actually, like, try to cast the film. Um <laughs> Yeah, like a director, like a casting director was able to be found in Los Angeles. Uh, Canadian yeah. casting directors did not. Nope. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so it it just, you know, it it just was not great uh, for trying to get this movie actually done. Uh, so much so that literally uh, the Toronto Star, uh, which is a Toronto publication, yeah, uh, yeah. announced that uh, Telefilm was funding a, quote, teen slasher movie met with a flurry of debate uh, and outrage in the media, which then just generated um, adverse publicity uh, in proportion to the size of this project. So yeah. pretty much what it was is that, you know, it's the terrifier two of it all in a weird way, but not really where people okay. are like, Oh my God, people are throwing up in the theater. And like, this is the craziest <laughs> movie ever. But like for regular horror fans who are like, this is just Tuesday. Like it's, fine. <laughs> it's just a, yeah, it's pretty whatever these days. Yeah. Whatever. But like, but this was kind of like, Oh, how can you, can you believe that they're doing this right after? But it's like, wait a minute. And they literally had to kind of explain. They're like, okay, no, it's not a, like a slasher movie. It's literally a werewolf movie. Like there's not, it's not the kind of violence you think there is yeah. because that's what kind of cat scream three to it's, you know, that's what kind of affected that production. Mm-hmm. Um, and they had to go a different way with it. So like, okay. and a lot of th- teaching Mrs. Tingle was another one. Hmm. Um, Kevin Williamson's only directorial thing that okay. got really, uh, a lot of things just because media got tamped down upon because of this. And yeah, it's just, uh, it's so stupid. I could go yeah. on about it. I mean, I I remember early 2000s when they were talking about it. And it still comes. It's sort of like waves or cyclical where all of a sudden video games will be the thing. Oh, this is what's actually causing all the violent behaviors of video games. It's like, yeah, there's like 8 million research studies done that show you that, no, it doesn't do anything at all. <laughs> like literally other nothing. Co- other countries have video games, too. And they don't have the same issues. So maybe it's not video games, but yeah. So maybe. I, yeah, I remember because like Mortal Kombat, like looking back on that today, mm-hmm. like just thinking about that, like, oh, this is what did it. So it's like, oh, those pixels. Oh, they saw yeah. those those red pixels. So they went crazy. No. Yeah, I agree. Just trying it's to pass the like, buck onto something else. Onto something else. Right. Uh, fun little thing too. Uh, Fawcett revealed in 2021 that originally the role of Bridget was going to be played by a young Scarlett Johansson, actually. Huh. Not too far off. They were looking for people in L.A. and they were looking for people all over the place. Yeah. So it makes enough sense. But her mother did not want her involved after reading a boycott of this film by casting directors in Canada. So thanks, Canada. Instead, they, instead they put her in Home Alone 3. They did. And they also put her in Ghost World. That also happened too. So I don't yeah. remember Ghost World. I know I know of it. But with her and Thora Birch and C. Buscemi. Oh, okay. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. <laughs> um she's fun in it. I kinda like her in it, but yeah. you know, it's cool. But yeah, so they cast this film finally with these two young ladies, um, yeah. who again were like a 
again, they were already kind of like Emily Perkins was already like in her early twenties. Whereas I think, uh, Catherine Isabel, I think was like 18 or when she did this, like somewhere mm-hmm. around there, uh, somewhere in that ballpark. So they were able to cast this movie thank thankfully. Yeah. Um, and they shot uh, about six weeks, uh, from October to December of 1999. Um, And so they shot around um, some Toronto suburbs, Scarborough, Mm -hmm. Brampton, and Ebtobecoke. I don't even know how to say this, but whatever. Canadian Uh, words are weird. Canadian words are weird. (laughs) Um, Etobicoke is what it sounds like. All right. So, okay, cool. (laughs) Um, But yeah. And so, uh, but because they did this in the winter time in Toronto for like mm-hmm. 16 hours a day, six days a week, <laughs> it meant, it meant that our people got sick pretty regularly, which is yep. not funny, but like Catherine Isabel, literally, if you know the scene where after, um, she goes to school after her, her werewolf attack yeah. and she walks down the hallway, Jennifer, Bo- Jennifer's body style, yeah. um, she just remembers that she was so sick that day. <laughs> All right. She's like, I felt like trash, but like, you know what? I'm going to look great. Like yeah. it's, it's a whole thing. Acting. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> um, and then of course, you know, getting into everything, but I will give it credit because this movie was low budge. I sure. mean, I got to give it that. Like you could say what you want about the werewolf stuff or whatever, or the yeah. crack, you know, the, the creature or whatever. Yeah. It's still fucking practical. Yeah. That's a, I mean, that's the thing. Like it's set in 2000, it's super low budget and yeah. they use practical effects and the practical effects that they had, I mean, for 2000 are pretty good. I mean, if you right. compare them to today's standards, then obviously, you know, it's okay, but it's, I was, that was 24 years ago. It's a long time. It's a long time, y'all. It's a yeah, long it's time. A long time. So no, but I mean, for that time, like I said, if I had seen this then, I'd been like, probably would have blown my mind. Like, wow, right. these animatronics are pretty, pretty insane. But yeah, yeah. I mean, for that low of a budget, I think they did a fantastic job for what they had. Yeah, yeah. And they had a guy who I think um, I don't remember his name off the top of my head. He was also on the bonus features on the Blu-ray, but. Okay. uh he was also a fan. Like that guy was also a fan of like um, werewolf stuff. So Mm -hmm. they had somebody who was interested in wanting to bring to life this, this creature. And -hmm. I think they did a pretty good job at it. So not, not too many notes to give, you know, I mean, it was fine for what it was. So, yeah, I mean, uh, like I said, this released uh, actually it premiered, I think I said Zurich, Switzerland earlier. It was uh, Munich, actually, in August Uh, 2000. Um, And then played at TIFF, which is Toronto International Film Festival. Um, And it kind of got this word of mouth, really. Um, And yeah, I mean, it ended up playing at various film festivals. And then it was able to pretty much go on home video, which is why this didn't really get like a... uh, it didn't really get a uh, domestic theatrical release, but I think it did pretty decent internationally where they released it, like maybe in theaters and all that. So mm-hmm. much so that they made two other movies of it um, yeah. that were direct to video. Um, so there's that. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, and you know, uh, Jennifer's body, there's a little bit of a comparison to this and ginger sure. traps, you know, to yeah. these movies. Oh, I definitely see that. I see it, you know, yeah. um, it, if anything, Jennifer's body is very much about toxic female friendship. Mm-hmm. This is very much about a <laughs> toxic sister relationship. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe <laughs> it's <Yeah>. there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. But uh, but yeah, that's a little bit about the production. Um, really. Uh, like I said, I've seen both of the sequels. Uh, they're on Tubi. If you feel like watching them, go ahead. Okay. Um, you know, I mean, nothing to write home about. I don't think, but you know, they are perfectly cool. But I think this movie, if anything, um, yeah, it's a very for somebody who you know had only done like some you know small films here and there like before Mm -hmm. and for this to kind of be the thing that he'll be known for for his whole career yeah i think they did a pretty bang up job it wasn't too too bad you know oh yeah 100 percent. yeah i mean like we like we talked about for the budget and all those hoops you had to jump through and production hell of like dealing with all that other stuff um you know a lot of times when that happens in movies it ends up turning out just to be 
terrible because at that point they're just like let's just we just got to make it at this point so they just sort of like slap it together as well as they can that you know if you would have not told me all that i would not have guessed that that was the situation going into it and been like oh no this seems like a very well made movie well written well acted you know all that stuff and the practical effects are good especially like the the transformation scenes in the van where, you know, they show like the bones popping out and stuff like that. Like those are really cool practical effects that remind me of like some of the neat stuff they did with like American Werewolf in London and things like that. And what's funny too, because I was also watching some of the special features, but like, you know, John Fawcett himself didn't really have like a, he wasn't pulling reference or influences from werewolf movies in particular sure his were you know like carrie and like yeah. you know the you know uh um what was the other one um the fly and like okay these other movies that aren't just necessarily dead ringers was another one you yeah. know um you know it, it wasn't just like werewolf movies i mean of course yeah. it's a little bit there but like you know, we're not talking about the Romani person who's like, you know, <laughs> sure. telling the the future, the night right? of the full moon. Exactly. There we're not go. doing that, really. No. But it's... Well, I mean, other than it just being a werewolf, like it really veers away from most standard or stereotypical werewolf lore anyways. So, you yeah, know, I definitely get that where you would, you know, you could say, oh, yeah, no, it, it it shows he is not super influenced or he's not trying to pay homage to other, you know, werewolf movies or anything like that because, yeah, he decides to go in a completely different direction with a lot of the aspects of lycanthropy. Exactly. Like, and that's what's kind of cool about it. And I think that's why, you know, in this movie, like, I think that's why it's kind of had the following that it's had because mm -hmm. it's a little bit different than a typical werewolf movie. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, if anything. But Dennis, I have a challenge for you a little bit. Oh. Nothing too crazy. <laughs> okay. But um, I would like to hear from somebody who's just watched this movie. Okay. If you had to explain this movie to somebody, or if you had to kind of do an elevator pitch of okay. like, what is Ginger Snaps about, really? Um, how, would you, how would you describe this movie to somebody who maybe has never seen it? Or how would you, how would you say? I would say the movie is a, I guess you could call it a fun take, but a fun sort of um, analogy of bucking against transitioning to womanhood, I would suppose, but, but dressed in, uh, in the plot is like aware, like basically like using lycanthropy as sort of like the mechanism. Like, yes, they definitely do talk about, you know, their periods and stuff like that, like that part of the transition. But also it's coupled with transitioning into becoming a monster and all this other stuff. So I would say really it's 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 sort of about just bucking the norm, like bucking normality of, you know, just what everyone expects you to do as like a woman, I would say. but also werewolves it's probably the easiest way i would describe it <laughs> hell yeah um yeah and i will also say too like you know um there are plenty of other podcasts that are you know that do have a female centered view of this movie mm -hmm. um please go check out the horror queers that have ariel fisher on it um this ends at prom did a great episode on this um you know there there are other folks that are a female, you know, experience and all this, you know, and of course that's cool. The reason I brought you on for this was because you'd never seen it before. So I wanted yeah. to get your takes on it and, and all this, but please be aware that like, we of course can talk about some of this, but we are two white cisgen, you know, cisgender, sure. you're heterosexual, I'm homosexual yeah. men talking about a movie that is very deeply, um, you know, female and, oh yeah, female centric uh so yeah it would definitely hit very right. different if you're a woman or you know if 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 you can better relate to the care that's any movie really yeah if you can better relate to a character or a person you will get more out of it or something different out of it than just sort of well you and i probably view it the same way almost like just an observer just like yeah. you know we're separated from we get it we understand it but we don't right. we don't have as much personal 
sort of stakes in the matter or experience in the matter, I guess, is the yeah. way that I would put it. So, yeah, I would definitely say it's it, I'm sure seeing it as a um, a woman, you know, trans or cis, mm -hmm. either way, I think, yeah, you would get a totally different experience out of this movie. Um, Agreed. Than, yeah. you know, us. And even even like a queer man's perspective. But again, yeah. it's also like it's about the monstrous femme, which I think is yeah. a really cool concept. And I'm always down for that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, give me Bride of Frankenstein any day. Like, oh, yeah. you know, you know, it's like these things where like I'm totally down with that. Yeah. But like, yeah, it's, you know, but again, please go listen to those other shows that have done this episode, too. My thing was that I wanted to get somebody who I I'm glad that I found somebody who's never seen this movie <laughs> so I can get those first impressions. And also just somebody who is very interested in like anthropy in general, um, who can bring that context as well. But that's a good way of uh, describing the movie. Um, if I, I guess I had to describe this, I'm not going to go beat by beat plot summary or anything. Sure. Um, if I had to explain this, this is about the story of two sisters, Bridget and uh, Ginger Fitzgerald, who live in Canada and they live in Bailey Downs. There's pretty much this, uh, you know, a ginger is uh, just experiencing her first menstruation cycle, and then uh, Bridget has not gotten hers yet. But in mm -hmm. the meantime of all this, these two girls are very, very morbid, very um, morose, if you will. I think yeah. John Fawcett explained um, that he saw them as Edward Gorey type of girls, okay. which I completely understand. Yep. Um, yeah, like, I get it. Uh, did you ever watch the Oblongs? The little cartoon have, back from the 2000s. I have, but I don't remember. <laughs> oh, uh, there's a little there's a little um character on there called Susie, and she's creepy okay. Susie, and she's like uh, this okay. little like yeah. If you remember her, <laughs> like she and Ginger and yeah. uh, Bridget, all they all they oh, yeah. all um they all bend together. Like they mm -hmm. are we in here? Like it's good. The kindred spirits. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but um yeah, but. There's also this like mysterious beast of Bailey Downs that you nobody really knows about because there's all these dead dogs that are showing up. That's my first nitpick. Oh, I know, right? We'll talk about you're gonna, it. You're going to tell me <laughs> that there's something going around killing people's dogs and that there's just not a giant party out, like a search party. It's like, no, we're just going to murder everything. Yeah, know, we're just going right? to roam around murder. There ain't nobody killing my dog. I'll turn into fucking Van Helsing. <laughs> I know. <laughs> if there's right. a monster running around murdering dogs. Like, yeah, no, totally. But yeah, so <laughs> there's this beast going on, right? And then um, because the girls are bullied at school a little bit, even though, you know, they fight back a little bit, but um, sure. they decide, okay, we're going to like, you know, pull this thing on this girl who's a complete bitch and we're going to like walk to her house and like, we're going to like do some shit. We're going to pretend like that her dog was gotten by the beast or whatever. Right. Yeah. And on their way to this thing, um, Ginger is attacked by the beast of Bailey Downs and is then turned into a werewolf herself. Um, but it's funny because she's a woman and we haven't completely seen that all the time. Although yeah. I think the Howling 2 did that apparently, but like we're not talking about the Howling 2 today. But you yeah. know, there have been female, like kind of sort of were werewolves, but not a whole sure. movie about it. No, 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 no. Where it literally talks about this. Anyway, so we find that Bridget herself, uh, she is not attacked, but you know, she's seeing her her sister change and morph. Um, and yeah, it's, it's pretty much that just like trying to figure out how can we turn her back into a human before she turns into a full werewolf. Mm -hmm. And then if anything, you know, it ends up, you know, these sisters have to fight against one another. And unfortunately one of them lives and one of them doesn't. So that's like the baseline idea of the yeah. movie really. Um, but yeah, I, I guess that's how I would explain it, you know, spoilers and everything. But you're sure. listening to a podcast, so like you should probably know that there's gonna be spoilers. And it was 24 years ago. It's also 24 years ago, and yeah, you literally you missed it. Sorry. Oh my god. Yeah, if you got this far, <laughs> like come we're on. We're beyond that. <laughs> we're beyond that. Like, okay, yeah. like whatever. But yeah. Uh, but that's the story pretty much. <laughs> but you know, I do kind of want to know a little bit. So, you know, talk about the story now. Do you have any particular like favorite scenes of this movie or a scene that you really liked from it? Particular favorite scenes from the movie. I would say 
definitely the scenes where Ginger is like her personality starts to change and you could tell that there are other effects. One of the weird things or one of the things that I was having trouble with watching the movie was like understanding the timeline because it seemed like the dude was transitioning a lot faster than she was. Um, but I would say one of the things I liked, which again, it's them sort of playing around with the werewolf mythos is the fact that she starts changing way before the full moon. It's just a slow sort of like her personality starts to change. She grows like a tail, <laughs> which was really, <laughs> it was really interesting them tying it down and all that stuff. Um, and like she would grow teeth and claws and like growing hair and, you know, random places, stuff like that. So I would say my favorite parts were probably just the interesting sort of ways that they dealt with that. And also the mom being like the most mom of moms until she just turns on a dime like those real awkward parent conversations. Normally, I don't like those in movies, but for whatever reason, they kind of made me chuckle in this movie. And then she just did a full 180 and she's like, yep, it's fine. You guys are murders. We're going to move out. It's going to be cool. We're going to get out because you're my babies. I was oh like, God, OK, I love it. didn't expect I love this. <laughs> I love Pamela in this movie so much. Yeah. Like she yeah. is ridiculous. I love how she's just like, your father would just blame me anyway. Like yeah. it's just, she's just like I'm willing to let the uh, house fill up with gas. I'll light a match. Yeah, it's down. It's fine. fine. But like talking about it completely nonchalantly, like even keeled, like not even like flustered in the slightest. Just like just normal, you know, whatever day of the week it is. Da, 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 da. I love it. It's so good. She is so ridiculous in camp, and I love it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just her styling too is really good. Oh my god, yeah. it's amazing. Yeah. Um, yes. So there's that. I would also, I would also say yes. I do also enjoy a lot of those scenes where Ginger is turning. Um, yeah. You know, I really enjoy those like the iconic scene where like she's walking down the hallway sure. and she's kind of feeling herself like that's a bit of awesome. the rogue haircut going on yeah <laughs> a little bit of the rogue hair going on yeah. like yeah it's really good there's that and then also like you know even like when she goes to the halloween party and she's like kind of fully changed pretty much yeah and she's like continually changing that's really cool too mm -hmm. um yeah i i I think I said this in a letterbox review of mine. It's funny because we were talking about Goosebumps earlier. Yeah. This feels like, in a weird way, an R rated episode of Goosebumps in some weird that. shape or form. I could see that. It, it's the fact that it's in Canada. Yep. At least three of these people who are in this movie, I think Emily, uh, not Emily Perkins, uh, Catherine Isabel, Chris Lemke, and one of the guys in this were all on episodes of that show. Oh, okay. It, like, yeah, as like kids, I think. Okay. Like all of them, like it just who knows, Jesse Moss might have even been in one. But like <laughs> the fact that like I think he was actually, but but just like it just that's what it's felt like to me a little bit. And that's okay. totally fine. Like yeah. I'm okay with that. Sure. But it just definitely feels like it doesn't surprise me that this movie definitely also did well home video wise and also on tv wise because okay. it does feel like a weird ass episode of a tv show or something yeah. but it's yeah. really but it's way cooler than that though <laughs> like oh, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. And like i said i wish i had seen this when i was you know when it came out like i was high, 2000 i was just going into high school like that is a I feel like if you're in that age range and you have yeah. more, it's like more your day to day life, you would definitely get more out of it in terms of like just like feeling it a bit more. Um, it also definitely feels like a 2000s movie at times where it's like, yes. yeah, this is definitely like the, I remember this is how they did certain things in movies back then. It's like, OK, it's fine. <laughs> we got away exactly. from that. It's fine. But that's exactly. every that's every decade. 80s movies, 90s movies are all the same. But yeah. yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, so, yeah, there's that. And just, I don't know, it's just really cool. And I, yeah, I just think it's a fairly unique take. I guess if we were to talk about like the characters of the movie, I think the big main ones uh, for that, this, uh, you know, are really Bridget and Ginger. Mm -hmm. um, not really talk about their mom a whole lot. 
because nah. it's whatever. But like also, everyone else like, is an ancillary character. They're not in I it think very so very much. It's I would say probably ninety percent of this movie's either Ginger or Bridget. And then yeah. you get some characters, you know, smattered around, mostly just to make the scenes keep going. Like the maybe the drug dealer guy got the next yeah. most screen time. I would say. But other than that, yeah, it's it's definitely those two show. Yeah, far. agreed. Yeah. And really, I think more so it's a Bridget story than it is yes. a Ginger story yeah. um, from also what I gather. What what are your kind of feelings on both of these characters, like these main characters? What do you think of them? So. They. So it's one of those things where it, it's interesting to watch these two especially with the beginning where they're talking about the suicide pact and they're making the the home videos and like all the real creepy, crazy, like suicide sort of pictures and videos and stuff like that. And seeing the teacher respond or react to it made me laugh, but um, they seem like they would be interesting people to know, even though they would be like the people that be like, they would say that they're not, or they would say like, I don't, you know, we don't want any friends or anything like that. Those types of people, for whatever reason, I just, find more interesting just because they have a different take on everything. Like they see everything a different way than most people, which is why standard high school movies, like the people who don't fit in with everyone else tend to stick out like a sore thumb and you know, they get bullied and all that stuff. And it's the same in here, but I, I did like the sister dynamic. I thought they played well together. Sort of Bridget was always, even though she was the mousy one in that particular relationship. And it started off with Ginger being the big sister sort of looking out for Bridget kind of a thing. It almost turned a bit where Bridget now has to be the one to try and take care of her sister because her sister is obviously not in control of her own faculties doing like all kinds of weird crap, killing people doing this. And it, like there are scenes like <laughs> this, I think it was after, Ginger killed the janitor and Bridge is just like, I'm so tired of your shit. Like, just come on. We're going like, we're just going to do this thing now. Like, fuck off. Like, just and she just takes more of a lead role. I just liked that transition through the movie of watching sort of the role reversal between the two of them, I guess. That's fair. That's totally that totally it checks out. Um, yeah, I think for me, at least, like, I do like how. If anything, Ginger is that, you know, older sister mm -hmm. and she is, you know, kind of exploring some stuff that, yeah. you know, she's trying to like, um, you know, she, after she is attacked, she kind of gets more into her own kind of sexuality and how she wants to like try to uh discover that more so um yeah probably because she's a werewolf now but like you know it comes along with the territory a little bit well, i was but trying to remember if this happened before the attack or after the attack where she started to notice the the guy that she ends up having sex with um like noticing her like on the field hockey field i can't remember before. if that it was before okay so she already sort of had a little bit of them those thoughts um it's just like a dab if you will but then the werewolf it part is. just sort of like jacked that up to 11 it. yeah yeah agreed yeah uh it's funny you say that the boy uh kind of you know uh transitioned into this more than the girl did at first i think that really kind of comes into this is just my theory um because men are just because men just like have a lot more fucking hormones and we're horny all the time and shit. That's, um, fair. that's a very generalization, but I mean, it's kind of true. I did enjoy how his lycanthropy also gave him like the worst acne. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like, OK, so it, it turned your puberty into like overdrive. Got it. <laughs> exactly. So that, I think that's probably why that was. And then hers was a little bit more subtle. And okay. then it kind of then turns into. So that's that's kind of what I thought, if anything. That's fair. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's that. Um, but, yeah, no, I, I think that's with Ginger. And then Bridget always was a little bit more just like asexual to me in a way like yeah. she just didn't want anybody you know no. wasn't interested in nobody but like no. i think it was just that she's coming after her sister and also just like she is the younger sibling no. and she's just trying to save her sister because she's like i don't think you're 
you're not uh, acting like yourself and what the yeah. fuck's wrong with you kind of a yeah. thing. So, yeah. um, I mean, and even yeah. the part where they, they, they sort of, I guess, explore the whole, uh, I think it's ginger that makes the accusation, but you know, they're talking about the, the drug dealer yeah. and Bridget and the drug dealer is like, I'm not in you. Like, I don't see you that way. I'm not, I'm not interested in that. And you can tell Bridget doesn't really see him in that light either. Sees him more, I would say is like a, is sort of like a, an odd friendship that, that spawns because of this whole like trying to work together to solve this issue. Right. Um, yeah, I definitely didn't. Yeah, I would say I'm right on board with you. She has more of an asexual feel to her where it's just like, yeah, yeah. it's just not it's just not anything she's interested in. Right. Yeah, that's what it felt like to me a little bit. And there was no romantic thing there. No. And really, you know, nothing is particularly romantic in this movie. <laughs> no. but like, obviously, Um I do love, as you were talking about Pamela, uh, again, I loved her one thing where um, when they're asking, they accidentally kill the popular girl and they put her in the freezer, right? <laughs> yeah. And uh, the mom's about to put like meat in the freezer and mm-hmm. you know, uh, Bridget just asks, she's like, what, <laughs> what do boys, boys like? <laughs> or what do boys want? She's yeah. like, oh, honey, I'm so glad you finally asked. And it just cuts to them in the living room and she has like tea or something. And then the mom's just like, and that's what guys want. <laughs> like, My favorite part of that. Is that she somehow, sometime, I don't know when, but she baked like eight batches of cookies for this Love conversation. That. I'm like, all right. <laughs> she had them on lock, apparently, oh, yeah. because I loved it. But I've been oh, saving so these. Funny. This is the boys' conversation cookies. So, yeah, boys' conversation. And then, yeah. you know what? You're right. You're absolutely right. Um, because men are <laughs> awful, you know? But, anyway, I, yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I you know guilty. I'm guilty sometimes. It's fine. But oh god, we'll right. say if you got cookies, I'll do whatever you want. It's fine. It's exactly. A, there you go. I'm easily now, I will, Exactly. Right. <laughs> uh so I guess if anything, so you know, we've talked a little bit about character and a little bit of the plot and all that fun stuff. Now I want to hear, see, we're circling back a little bit. I want right. to hear um what your nitpicks are you already kind of mentioned one of them but i want to hear a little bit about what your nitpicks of the movie are just so we can kind of i want to hear about those so one of the the, well there's a couple like minor things like the first dead dog that nuts it's definitely not the first dead dog but the one that bridget gets pushed into i'm like so you're gonna tell me that nobody on the field hockey field saw a dead dog (laughs) in the middle of this field with them playing and then when she gets hit and she's in it the gym teacher's like oh yeah just go get cleaned up i was like no they would freak out that you just had a face full of dead whatever but the main nitpick that i had actual plot nitpick was the fact that ginger has fangs and claws in school and just nobody draws any attention to it whatsoever and then when bridget is talking to drug dealer guy and they're, before they have this conversation, they're like, hey, he thinks I'm the one that's a werewolf, so, so don't tell him otherwise. I'm like, she's got fangs. <laughs> How would he not notice the fangs? And yeah, that scene plays on and nobody pays any attention to the fact that she's got fangs. Now, somebody talked to me like, well, maybe she's a fur. I was like, that wasn't really a thing in 2000 like it is today. Like, that's it's not, I don't remember it ever being a thing where people had fangs or anything like that. I was like, ah, I think that's trying to explain it away with a modern day sort of telling. But for whatever reason, that was that bugged me throughout the whole movie. It's like, how does no one like they cover up the tail? Cool. That makes sense. That's a really logical way to do it. But nothing about the fangs or the claws. <laughs> she has claws. <laughs> Yeah, those are definitely, uh, this is art, Dennis, okay? And sometimes I, I you have get it. to be able to. <laughs> I get it. It just bugged me every scene that nobody painted. Yeah. I was like, how's no one see this? <laughs> Am I, I taking know. crazy pills? It's, well, yeah. No, it's all good. But yeah, it's, yeah, no, it's fair. Like, it makes, uh, you have to suspend that disbelief. But I think if anything, sure. like, you know, I, I think if anything, <laughs> like, with that, I, yeah, but the, you do make a good point, though, of just like, you know, nobody would have noticed this already. Uh, <laughs> yeah. All this shit. Um, I will also say as part of some of the favorite scenes I've had or, or anything like that, um, I really do like the end of this movie mm-hmm. um, because 
it was funny because somebody i think it was on the bonus features but i don't remember who said it um it's interesting because like werewolves themselves like are definitely scary and like terrifying sure but it's interesting because like when you think about it you're afraid of something that can't even really open a door by itself so like it's one of these things where you're just like but they're obviously like wanted to kill you and like yeah. tear your tear you apart sure. so like yeah i i just but i like the end of this because really it's just when um so the end of this movie is where you know bridget has um she's trying to like take the monkshood syringe of monkshood um Mm -hmm. you know distilled shit and she's trying to uh cure ginger and what ends up happening is that ginger fucking gets killed and like dies Mm -hmm. um and she and you know the movie ends with her and and bridget just like kind of laying with one another and just Mm -hmm. being like all right like you know i'll be here for you because their whole thing was like out by 16 or you know whatever the hell they had their whole little like pact but it's interesting how like you know it kind of i thought it was very you know uh, in a way i thought it was very poetic to kind of end it that way because Mm -hmm. they kind of got what they you know, they kind of got what their pact was in a way, which I thought yeah. was, was interesting. So. No, that I mean, the the strongest part of the movie is the sister's relationship. So, okay. you know, a lot of times with werewolves and it is, a, you know, trope where the person who's the closest to the werewolf usually is the one that ends up having to, you know, either die or kill them, kill the creature to save themselves sort of a thing. Mm-hmm. Almost, I, I'm. There aren't very many werewolf movies where they don't do that sort of similar thing where the person that loves them is the one that kills them. But it, I mean, I think the reason why that's a trope and why it happens so much is that it does make for a very powerful scene where you end up having to kill the person that you care for the most in the world. And in this movie, especially like those two are like the only two each other have because like, yes, the mom loves them, but they don't really they don't really care that much about the mom. And dad's just kind of girls. So, yeah, yeah exactly. They're 15. They're, yeah. Um, and then dad is the dad or whatever, but yeah. So for them, they, they're the only ones that get each other. They're the only ones that understand each other. Everybody else is like a completely foreign to them and doesn't really get it. Even when Ginger does her transition and her personality changes, it's almost like her sort of matching the other people or what, what is normal for other people. Whereas Bridget still tries to see her as the way that, you know, they've always been, you know, before that. So that last scene where Bridget ends up, you know, killing uh, her sister is especially powerful for that very reason. And then she even looks down. She's like, I had the syringe in my hand, but she, you know, ended up stabbing her with the, with the knife instead. So, um, and it was definitely, you know, a good way to go out in terms of like, it just fades to, it just cuts, it just fades to black right there with the two of them. It doesn't go into anything else. doesn't try to explain anything else. That's a good stopping spot and just boop, you know, right there. Yeah. Agreed. It's just like, I think that really is really strong with it. And I, I completely agree with what you're saying is that this, you know, the biggest thing for this movie is the sister's relationship. And I think that's why a lot of people have kind of been able to see themselves in this or have been able to have this movie be something that means something to them because we just don't get that a ton, you know, and and it's just, there aren't a ton of examples of this kind of horror media that have these like very strong female characters, or at least maybe not strong in terms of will, but like more so just like you, their personalities, if anything, like you will, you don't forget Bridget and, and you know ginger really yeah um more so because of their look or like just how they kind of treat this or how they are in this whole movie but like yeah no totally i i absolutely agree are there any other particular themes of this movie you picked up on um lycanthropy or not i guess that you'd want to kind of touch on before we start to like you know wrap it all up and all that kind of stuff no, I, I wouldn't say that. I, I think we we pretty much touched on the main themes, especially, you know, with the sister's relationship, but also, you know, the, the transitioning or changing or fighting the, the, you know, the norm and stuff like that. We've already talked about that a little bit. Yeah. I will say the one thing that because they definitely do werewolves very different in this than they do in other movies. And there are definitely some very interesting take. The one thing that kind of. 
like you said, <laughs> if you just like a locked door, they can't open a door. I mean, that yeah, they are very strong, so they probably could still get through it. But they also seem like they're just very easily dispatched. Like, just quick. All right. Stab. One stab. Boop. Done. Well, like I hit by a car. So like that yeah. one obliterated that one. So I'm like, OK, I get it. But one of the other interesting things is when they cha- when they die, a lot of times in werewolf movies, when they die, they switch back to just being a normal person so that anybody else who comes along, they're not going to know any better. It just looks like you just killed a random person in this. They don't switch back. It's more of a it's not so much of a curse. It's more of a disease because they even talk about it that way. And I mean, it is an STD or at least they they transfer it through sex and whatnot. So it acts very much. Um, what was that? There was another movie that was more much more recent that did something like that. It follows. I think it was where. Yes, it was transferred via sex or whatever. So, yeah, yeah, that was an interesting way to do it as well. And then we had already talked about it a little bit. Uh, but, you know, that whole them transitioning into a werewolf over the course of an entire month as opposed to it just happens you know on the full moon and then they switch back no this seems like it's more of a a permanent sort of change i would have been curious to see what would have happened if she did stick her with the needle like would she change back or would she be stuck that way because that's a lot of physical changes to then like revert out of so i'd be curious would she then just be a you know a dog monster but with Ginger's normal mind, um, I don't know. Th- those are like the kind of things that I was I was just thinking about on the side, unrelated to the plot. Be like, I really wonder what would happen with this because of how they set up a sort of, you know, how the world works or how the, the mythos or the mythology, stuff like that. That interests me to figure out like, OK, so like what are all the parameters for this stuff? Like what if this and what if that? Um, I don't know. That stuff always interests me. And because they did it so different in this movie, um, I found that part to be really interesting from a werewolf perspective anyways. Yeah, absolutely. And I think if anything, it kind of goes back to, I think, what um, what John Fawcett had said before was that this is, you know, it's a werewolf movie, but it's a metamorphosis movie. And, yeah. and it was going to be something different than what the normal yeah. was. So I thought that was really, really cool. And I think the overall kind of thing is that, like you were saying, like this is transmitted kind of as like an STI, if you will, you mm-hmm. know, which is which is interesting. And, you know, hadn't really seen that a ton, you know, Um like this but also of course talking about how like i talked a bit a little bit about it earlier but like you know having this like monstrous femme you know and having lycanthropy also be you know uh kind of uh it's not an analogy but like it's a way of uh it's a way of kind of, you know, comparing it to something like female puberty. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's totally, it's, it's really interesting and I think does kind of line up. And I think that's exactly why this movie in particular really resonated with, you know, young, um, you know, cisgendered females. And then mm-hmm. also just the idea of like transitioning into something that, you know, um, even though you know she got like attacked obviously and then she's sure. turning into this thing i think also even though i'm not a person of trans experience but i mm-hmm. do can understand that trans folks as well you know also have a, a a level of reverence for this movie maybe because yeah but she is turning into this she is transitioning into this thing that she you know is going to be whether she kind of wants to or not but like mm-hmm. it's it doesn't surprise me that like when you see like the girl with the tail and being able to kind of talk about that with like the experience of a trans woman, it's like, you know, it's, it's hard not to see that if you want to read into it like that, you know, and how do you hide this thing, you Mm -hmm. know, and like whatever, that kind of stuff. Um, So I think also that's why some trans folks as well have kind of seen this as like, uh, this is an interesting movie. And like just these movies in general can kind of have that. Even something like I was a teenage werewolf, you know, Um, very coded with like gay stuff. Oh, yeah. Like Michael Landon. Was he just like gay in the movie? Like maybe like, I don't know. Like. (laughs) It may, like, but definitely you can read into that, and sure. I absolutely read into that with yeah. with that movie, especially. Mm-hmm. But you know, that's a fantastic little movie. Actually, it's not too bad. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, it's just 
And I think also maybe like some queer folks like this movie too, um, for that reason of like, it has this weird kind of like, it, it's not like super duper camp, but it's like, it's a dark comedy. And also yeah. like, it's very female centered. And like, yeah. I think queer folks can also kind of like it for that reason too. Yeah. Where they're just like, wow, I got, I get it. Like, you know, I understand why, why people in the queer community can also enjoy it. Yeah. Um, no, hundred percent under oh totally understand um but yeah i think the overall like i think if anything the overall legacy of this movie will be one where it is a strong you know i think it is a strong film that you know it's a strong movie that has a female center to it and i think Mm -hmm. it is a unique take on this like werewolf genre if you will um that I think we hadn't really seen before by mm-hmm. that point. And I think if anything has gone on to kind of um, be able to influence some stuff as well um, mm-hmm. within the teen horror genre and all that. And I think that's what its legacy will be, if anything. So I, I think it's very, I think it's a very decent movie. I guess, what are your kind of th- final thoughts on the movie being that it's your first time watching it? Um, what, what are your kind of your final, your Jerry Springer thoughts on all this film? <laughs> No, so, you know, it is a super creative movie for being 2000, especially with a low budget. And even today, 24 years later, uh, there are things in this movie that I have not seen, you know, in that sort of genre in terms of like werewolves and stuff like that since. Like, I haven't seen, you know, that I've seen a lot of different werewolf stuff, but I haven't seen it portrayed quite that way before or since then. Um, So I would say it's very unique in that standpoint and the relationship between the sisters is both understandable relatable um and just interesting between the two of them and sort of the journey that they go on throughout the movie is very interesting i like their each of them have their own little arcs and sort of almost role reverse by the end of the movie um and i also dig that it really isn't romantic at all and they don't try and like inject that into the movie at all. like i usually I'm somebody if you're going if you're going into a movie for you you know wanting romance okay that's fine but like it needs to like that's the movie it needs to like I want to go into the movie expecting that's what it is I don't need to just throw it into every movie just for you know shits and giggles um, with this I like that you know I it is a it's a high school movie and yeah they kind of touch on Ginger doing you know this and that but it's not I mean nothing about it's romantic and it's more of a needs kind of a thing. Um, or her just raw id just operating of its own accord. Um, so from that standpoint, I really enjoyed that part too, where it's more focused on the characters and them just trying to figure out what's going on, what to do next. Um, and yeah, just trying to solve a problem using basically what they know in their everyday lives and what they have at their disposal. I like that part. And then obviously the the camp of like the mom. That's really the only thing that I would say is campy about the movie. Everything else they take pretty much seriously. Um, the mom's the only thing that's just kind of like off the wall, <laughs> sort of like doesn't really fit A little with the weird, rest of it. Yeah. yeah, but it works in the movie, I would say still, because it makes total sense that her kids would be that way if she's that way. <laughs> <laughs> like I can imagine that a lot of times, you know, you get, you have hippie parents and then you got the super straight laced kids and then you got the super straight laced parents and you got, you know, the more loosey goosey kids. So I get it. You have the very like most mommy of mom. Like she's just mom. Like if you just look up mom in a dictionary stereotype, boom, Pam. So the girl's are like, no, it's just opposite, total opposite of those guys. So yeah, no, yeah, Agreed. I would say that's, those are my final thoughts on the movie. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think like it. I would recommend it too. Yeah. I don't yeah. think it's like aged horribly or anything. No. Um, like truly, like I don't think there's anything where I'm like, you know, and I think we already talked about kind of your your, your nitpicks, but even those, like they're, they're not nitpicks. major. <laughs> like they're not I mean, major. Yeah, they're just n- yeah, they're nitpicks. The only thing that you, uh, you could even broach on major is the fact that no one pays any attention to her having teeth and claws. <laughs> right. <laughs> like that's the only thing I'm just like Okay, whatever. I mean, after exactly. a few scenes, you're just like, all right, I guess just nobody pays attention to anything, but it's fine. I guess it's fine. so, right? Yeah, whatever, right. fine. It's high school, yeah. nobody pays attention. And maybe that's the whole thing, too, <laughs> of yeah. like, 
people are in their own bullshit that it's like yeah. they don't even notice this <laughs> like yeah. who knows <laughs> but yeah, yeah. but, but yeah, this movie it's, is, it's still nitpicking yeah yeah true true <laughs> But I think if anything, like, yeah, that's what this movie has in terms of legacy. That's what this movie will have. And that's why it's a cult film, because it yeah. got these repeat movie viewings on TV. Mm-hmm. It did well on direct to video. Mm-hmm. Um, all of this kind of stuff, I think, just because it is a very unique tale. And and yeah. And what's cool, too, is that it is so accessible. Like. Oh, yeah. You can watch it. You, I like, I literally said, Dennis, like, it's literally on YouTube. Like, go yep. watch it. Like, you yep. know, it's on Shutter. It literally has a, it has, it's on Prime. It's on Blu ray if you want to get it. Um, literally, I don't think there's a moment where it's not available somewhere for free. So I'm just like, you know, I mean, if you have not, I mean, if you've gotten this far, like, what the hell? But okay. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but, um, it's nice because you can always watch this kind of no matter when. Um, and yeah, it's like a fun little thing. I also think it's a nice little, I guess to not, to, not depending on your gender or anything, but it is a fun little thing where like, you kind of want to throw it to somebody who maybe is like teetering on whether they like horror or not. I'm like, what do you mm-hmm. think of this? Like, what do you think of this movie? Huh? Like, you know, because I yeah. feel like it's enough where like, <laughs> again, to me, uh, in the best way possible, it does feel like a weird R-rated episode of like a Goosebumps thing or something. Yeah, like it just does. I, I like, definitely see it. As soon as you said it, I was like, I I would never have thought that until you said it. As soon as you said it, I was like, now I can't unsee it. <laughs> it's just it's just there. Like yeah. I don't. It, I've already explained a little bit, but like it's just there. But I think it'd be cool to kind of get somebody who you know uh, is maybe not like it's kind of teetering on whether they like it or not, or, or it's mm-hmm. just a nice little thing where it's like, Hey, have you ever watched this? Like you should watch it. It's fun. Yeah. You know, it's, it's enjoyable. Um, but yeah, but I think that will bring our conversation to a close today. All right. Um, but, uh, Dennis, thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm so happy to have gotten your, your first time impressions on this movie that I so deeply enjoy. Um, and I'm glad you enjoyed yourself with it. Um, Again, you know, please, please, if you would like to, um, if you want to give to the Kickstarter for, um, you know, Dennis's project of, uh, you know, this whole werewolf graphic novel thing <laughs> going on, uh, please, you know, open your purse uh, and give some money if you want to. Um, you know, if you don't want to, that's fine as well. You yeah. know, maybe just post about it on social media or, you know, uh, and all that kind of good stuff too, if, if you're so inclined. Um, but with that being said, if you want to plug your social media as Dennis so that people can find out who you are and if they, you know, you want people following them and just plug yourself. Sure. Well, first off, I want to say thanks, Jesse, for having me. It was a lot of fun. I had a great time. Uh, thanks for finally making me watch this movie because I've been putting it off for many years now. <laughs> um, but you can find me on social medias at World's Most Okayest DM. And that title is because of the podcast that I'm on. Botched a D&D podcast. It's an improv comedy show draped in the loose skin of Dungeons and Dragons with a little bit of drinking involved. And if you like horror... Our current season is set in the SCP universe, if you're familiar with that. And uh, you can find it on all your podcatchers or over on botchpodcast.com. And uh, you can also, like we talked about before, I write graphic novels about the world's first werewolf. I have two out right now, and the third one's on Kickstarter. And if you want to go check out the Kickstarter and see all the fun stuff that's on there, www.likenbook.com, L-Y-C-A-N-B-O-O-K.com. And then I also have a website if you want to check that out, hiveheadstudios.com, like beehive hiveheadstudios.com that's all for me yes i love that and of course as always you can always follow the show here cult cinema circle on uh instagram at cult cinema circle or on twitter i don't call it x uh it's cult cinema circle <laughs> and of course um i don't really post on twitter like that but whatever uh you can follow the show if you feel like it you can also follow me on uh letterboxd at jesse j-e-s-s-e kremp k-r-e-m-p it is both my personal and the show page i guess um where i just talk about the movies i've watched and all that kind of fun shit um and all of that um and then please as you were talking about with your show dennis um you know uh please give me a uh five stars one two sentence review on this show um it gets people to see the show more on your podcatcher of choice of whatever so apple Podcasts, spotify google podcast is going away y'all so you can't use that after a while but you know there's that um i'm on audible 
all the places, you know. And I'm on YouTube too, so you can watch. You can um not watch me. You'll listen to me on YouTube if you want. Um, so there's that. And yeah, and I I'm not going to tell you what the next episode is because I think I already did that in the last episode that I did <laughs> on Phantasm. Um, because this is more of a little bonus thing, but it's not part of my um. It's on the main feed of my show, but like sure. Um, you know, but if you want to hear what I'm going to be covering, like on March 20th or whatever, go listen to my episode on Phantasm because I'm going to tell you what I did there. I'm not going to tell you this here. OK, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but thank you so much for coming, Dennis. I really appreciate it. And uh, I hope you have a good rest of your day and evening. OK, you too. As always, thank you for taking the time to listen to the Cult Cinema Circle podcast. And remember, I'm a goddamn force of nature. Take care. Bye.